Watson. Good evening, everyone. It's May 2nd, 2022. This is a regular meeting of the Moscow City Council. Gina. Good evening and happy May, even though we are all still layered. <laughs> Please stand with us and let's have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, good stuff. Uh, first up on the agenda tonight are a pair of proclamations, and I'll start with the first one. Uh, not in the same order as it appears on the agenda, but Public Service Recognition Week in honor of the millions of public employees at the federal, state, county, and city levels. Whereas Americans are served every single day by public servants in the city, county, state, and federal levels, these unsung heroes do the work that keeps our nation working. And whereas public employees take not only jobs, but oaths, and whereas Moscow's public servants include public safety, public works, culture and recreation, community development, and administration professionals that support the delivery of quality municipal services and ensure the responsible use of community's resources to build public trust and enhance Moscow's sense of community. And whereas, day in and day out, public servants provide diverse services demanded by our local community with efficiency and integrity. And whereas, public servants at every level of service provide continuity to support the regular changes of leaders and the elected officials in their communities. Now, therefore, I, Art Betke, Mayor of the City of Moscow, do hereby proclaim May 1st through the 7th, 2022, as Public Service Recognition Week in the City of Moscow, and I encourage all citizens to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of government employees at all levels, city, county, state, and federal. So, We've got employees, but uh, nobody on the docket to come up and actually accept the certificate. All right. However, and whereas, as we move on, whereas. second proclamation, this is the Bike Month Proclamation. Whereas, National Bike Month began in May 1956, and whereas bicycling has been an affordable, environmentally sound mode of transportation, an excellent form of exercise and fun recreation since the first pedal-propelled bicycle appeared in the 1860s. And whereas bicycling contributes to retail sales, tourism dollars, infrastructure, and policies that support community livability. And whereas biking community, bicycle commuting benefits both employees and employers through better health and fitness, lowers costs, and reduces parking space. And whereas bicycling reduces heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, and improves mental health and cardiovascular fitness. And whereas Bike to Work Week 2022 will take place May 16th through May 22nd. And whereas to celebrate Bike to Work Day, the City of Moscow and Moscow Pathways Commission will be on the corner of 6th and Main Street on Friday, May 20th from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. The public is welcome to stop by and enjoy coffee donated by One World Cafe and light refreshments donated by the Moscow Food Co-op. And whereas to celebrate Bike Month, the City of Moscow and the Moscow Pathways Commission will host the annual Bike Ride Tour on Saturday, May 21st, 2022 from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. following the Moscow Farmers Market. The annual bike tour will begin at the Gormley Park Shelter and ride right out to the Idaho State Line, then back again along the Paradise Pathway. Light refreshments will be served following the annual bike tour. Have to. Now, therefore, I, Art Betke, the mayor of the city of Moscow, do proclaim May 2022 to be Bike Month in Moscow, and I urge everyone who can to cycle to work, school, shopping, and errands, or simply for pleasure. And I'd like to invite uh, Tanya Dennison, the chairman of the Pathways Commission, up to accept the award. <laughs> Come on, David.
So would you like to say a few words on behalf of the bike people, or are you just going to put it in with everything else? Yeah, we'll say a few words for an annual report coming up. Yeah. There you go, Way to circumvent that, David. Right. Next up is the consent agenda. You're yes. up. Oh. I move we approve this consent <laughs> agenda. Second. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, we'll get there. Yeah, when we get there. I'm not there yet. Julia. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Sandra. Aye. Haley. Aye. And Gina. Aye. Mayor Becky. Um, Excuse me, Mayor Becky. Uh, Lori had sent an email. There was a Scrivener's error on the consent agenda regarding the minutes. Uh, the minutes reflect April 25th. The, all the attachments are for April 18th. So just wanted to recognize that um, there was that Scrivener error and you're okay with proceeding. Yep. Yeah. So I think we all saw that. And although our paper says the 25th, uh, it is the 18th on uh, all the other forms of record. Great. Thank you. So. Uh, let's see. Next up is mayor's appointments, and I have two for tonight. The first is Carson Ellis for Fair and Affordable Housing Commission, expiring 12-31-22. And uh, second one is Cole Mize for the Planning and Zoning Commission, expiring 12-31-2023. Your Honor, I move that we approve the slate of appointments. Second. second. Um, Whoever wants it, so give it to Haley. <laughs> Haley, it's all yours. Okay, so welcome. Let's see, I see Cole back there. Would you like to come up and say... We need to vote first. We need to vote. Oh, we... <laughs> <laughs> we had a second. Okay. Uh, Julia. Aye. Haley. Aye. Gina. Aye. Sandra. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Good. Now, <laughs> would you like to come up and say a few words? Now that you're officially on the Planning and Zoning Commission after just finishing up with the uh, Board of Adjustment. Yeah, uh, happy to be a part of it. I'm looking forward to learning more about it and serving the community. So, right so you have good background for it and I know you'll do well. There's <laughs> another one of your fellow commissioners right there in the front row. <laughs> so, well, thanks, so thanks, much. Cole. Thank you for serving. Is Carson out there by any chance? Would you like to come up and say a few words? <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> okay, next on is public comment, mayor's response period. And for the next 15 minutes in three minute chunks, uh, we receive uh, comments from the public as long as it's not on tonight's agenda nor pending before Planning and Zoning Commission or the Board of Adjustment. So if anybody would like to come up and Tell us what's on your mind. Just come up with their name, city of residence, and uh, tell us what you got for three minutes. <coughs> Off you go. Hello. Uh, my name is Christina Manchapani. I live at 1021 Orchard Avenue. And I actually am not sure if this is pending in, in planning and zoning or something. So I guess stop me if, <laughs> if it is. Um, we recently heard from a handful of folks who had lots to say in protest of a planned safe and sober living residence here in town. And I thought it was probably time we heard from an advocate of it. I only have three minutes, so I'm gonna assume um, most of you know the background. Uh, to start, I'm not a representative of the Leitar Recovery Center, but I am a strong supporter of what they do for and in our communities. While I can recognize that the folks in opposition have concerns that are obviously deeply felt, the Leita Recovery Center has a responsibility and a mandate not to give in to them. Ooh, I'm nervous. Uh, and I would add that all of us who support their work and support building a more accepting and inclusive community share in that responsibility. It's not just that we wholeheartedly disagree with them. We disagree that anyone struggling with substance use or mental health should be restricted in where they live or how they're treated. We disagree that any individual who has used drugs or alcohol should be banned from living near children. Most of them have children of their own. Uh, but it's also that, in fact, to also alter the course as a result of these emphatically expressed concerns to abandon a specific Oxford House location because of a protest about its place amongst families and recreation and education in our community 
would be in direct opposition to the Leitao Recovery Center's mission, which is to advocate for and assist those struggling with behavioral health issues and to destigmatize the obstacles associated with overcoming them, like being excluded. We've heard stories from new residents who've moved here from big cities where they didn't feel safe walking down the street because of the homeless population or the drug addicts, Whew, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and how they wouldn't want Moscow to turn into a similarly unsafe environment. We've heard statistics about rehab success rates and the expectation that failing once or twice or even seven times means you are a failure, full stop. That you will continue to fail or relapse. And that continuing to try apparently means that you're beyond saving or that you need to be kept separate from those who identify as non-failures. What we all need to understand is that when you ex <laughs> is that what you experience in Seattle or Portland or whatever urban town you moved here from is exactly what happens when you don't house the unhoused. When you don't consider mental health and substance use a public health issue that needs a community-driven and supported response. When you don't recognize that shunning our community members who are struggling is a decision to set them up to fail. When you don't understand that a good house and a good neighborhood with a good support system and good reliable resources is setting them up for success. And that we don't do these, when we don't do these things, that's when we create an unsafe, unfair, and unhealthy environment for our community. So I would urge us all to consider what we're really saying when we say, not here, not this house. And consider the message it sends to each and every one of our community members, including our children, when you try to exclude certain folks from living in certain neighborhoods. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Who else? Hi, I'm Sandy Billings. I live at 310 North Blaine. And I did not prepare a statement, but I came with my friend who you just heard from and some others in our community who feel the same. And I just wanted to stand up and let you know that there are, there's more than one, <laughs> there's more than a few, that we do care. We do think this is important. We do think that we are happy, we're not afraid to live with people who are trying to make their lives better. I might be afraid to live with people who aren't, <laughs> but we want to give the resources and make them available so that people, we all have struggled, and, and that these particular people who struggle with some things that are harder than so many others have a chance, and that we help provide that chance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Here, did you take my coat off? <laughs> so warm in here. So hi, I'm Andriette Piron. I know some of you. And I've lived in Moscow for 26 years, and I'm a business owner here. I run Andriette's Bed Book and Bicycle, and I'm also a professional licensed mental health therapist. So I speak from different perspectives. I, I also bring some personal experience. I have been married, I had been, not anymore, to um, an alcoholic, and we were married for 18 years. And um, we did divorce, but he needed more resources than what Moscow had available. Um, and so it broke up the family, and, and it was sad. <laughs> um, part of the uh, trauma that that, I, I believe, d developed in our family was that my son now has schizophrenia, so he is very much um, struggling with mental health and mental illness. So um, I'm really grateful to be living in Moscow. I think we're completely unique. I think we have people of all faiths. We have people of all colors, genders, educational backgrounds. We're an eclectic group of people, and we are accepting and inviting 
to, and hospitable to newcomers because we're a transient community and we have a lot of newcomers, a lot of professors, students, uh, professional people come and go. But we open our hearts to them and we say, come join our community. We know that you have something to offer us and we have something to offer you and you can benefit us and we can benefit you. So we don't discriminate. But there's also other people who would like to be a part of our community and who would benefit so much from this hospitality, this personal care and treatment, and the safe and secure housing that Oxford House could provide for them. These people are our family members. They're um, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, mothers, fathers, best friends from high school, college roommates, veterans, <coughs> former professionals who've lost everything due to an addiction. Um, and currently, if a, an individual like this is released from jail, or addicted to drugs or alcohol and needs treatment and safe housing, they can't find it here in Moscow, Idaho. It doesn't exist. We're not supporting them. And I join with the philosophy and research from a world-renowned author and physician in mental health, and his name is Gabor Mate. And what he says is, my question to these people is not what is wrong with you. My question is what has happened to you? Because we know that research shows that all addictions are related to severe trauma as well as inherited traits. So if we understand what's happened to them and support their journey towards recovery and healing, then we will have community members that will do the same for others. And then we can keep the cycle growing and we have a healthier community. We already have a laughing, loving, and learning community. Let's enhance that. Let's embrace everyone. Let's not discriminate against the least and the lost and the left behind. People who have endured severe trauma and have physical and mental challenges to reintegrate into society. Many of these brothers and sisters are also veterans. They have risked their lives for our freedom and our safety. Do we abandon them now like society often does? Or do we want to share our time and our talents and our treasures with them? My hope is that we unify as Moscow residents and that we support Oxford House establishing here in Moscow. Thank you for your attention. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Denise Town, and I live at 840 Maybell here in Moscow. Um, I also came in support of Christina and of the Oxford House. Um, I have experienced, um, not myself, but within my family, the need for safe and sober living, and we were not able to find it um, in Moscow or even in the state of Idaho. Um, I do have experience where my son went to a safe and sober living rehab rehabilitation in a residential neighborhood. It was very, very successful. Um, the houses themselves are supervised. They are, um, the people, the residents that are there, they want to succeed in their rehabilitation. They want to become contributing members of our societies, and I think that we need to do everything that we possibly can to help them succeed. And giving them a place to, a safe place to live is one of the first steps that we need to do in that. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. Okay, we got time for one more. Okay, once, twice, thrice. Okay, thank you everybody who came up to speak. We appreciate it. We hate to have these 15 minutes for public comment go to waste, so we really encourage the people who are here, people who are watching out there on the TV, come in and tell us what's, what you think. It helps us make our decisions. Next up, item number four is the Citizens Commission report for the Moscow Pathways Commission. Dave Schott, and once again, Tanya Dennison, now famous at the podium. <laughs> now famous. <laughs> there we go. Mayor Betke, members of council, uh, thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, 
It's my pleasure to uh, reintroduce <laughs> Tanya Dennison. Uh, she is the chairman of our Moth Moscow Pathways Commission. Tanya grew up in Lake County and is a longtime resident of Moscow. She's the chief information officer at NRS, an avid cyclist and walker, and has been a member of the Moscow Pathways Commission since 2017. Tanya will be presenting the annual report for the Moscow Pathways Commission to City Council tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tanya. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, Mayor Becky and members of the City Council. I appreciate this opportunity to review the work of the Moscow Pathways Commission tonight. Let's see if I can figure this out. There you go. Uh, the mission of the Moscow Pathways Commission is to promote and advise on the development of a common pathway system in and around Moscow, um, around the three core tenants around active transportation, recreation, and resource conservation and enhancement. Um, the members include myself, Margaret Dibble, Aaron Bacon, Judy Brown, Becky Chastine, Janine Eslick, Robert Heckendorn, and I want to especially recognize David Schott for uh, his work coordinating between the commission and the city, and Donna Howard and her uh, amazing work organizing and documenta documenting all of the things that we do. Yeah. And then, of course, the city staff who do the installation and maintenance of our pathways, without which we would not be using them from one year to the next. Some of the more recent um, improvements and outreach projects that the commission has done are uh, in 2018, um, completed Blackbird Station, which is a rest spot between um, Steiner and Altura. And uh, so this is a nice meeting place honoring the late John Dickinson. He loved blackbirds and that's an appropriate space given the, the flock that makes its home there. Um, we installed pathway striping along portions of the pathway. Uh, this helps improve safety and respectful access along the space. Uh, the Highway 8 underpass, which hopefully everybody's familiar with at this point, um, the White Avenue addition of the pathway between the underpass and the fairgrounds, and then also the uh, Third Street Bridge, uh, which was, uh, I think that was all opened in 2019. Uh, so those are fairly recent improvements that increase accessibility and connectivity of our pathway systems. Uh, in 2021, we had our annual bike pathway tour where we take members of the public on a short segment of our paths so we can talk about the improvements that we've completed and we have planned and uh, it's also an opportunity for public input. And then we also celebrated bike to month, or bike month and, uh, sorry, bike to work day uh, with the public uh, where we get to uh, promote bicycling and our pathway systems. We also did some revamping of some of the uh, brochure and marketing around our pathways. So that gives us an opportunity to give some visuals around what the system looks like and how to access them with uh, updated maps as well. Uh, we've got continual change, um, which is <coughs> wonderful, but that means that we have to keep our, uh, our documentation up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, we also provided input for the Eddington and Woodbury uh, subdivisions which are coming. Um, that's a great opportunity for us to advise on how those proposed um, pathways will connect with the rest of our systems. And then uh, there's also a, uh, there was a consideration of a bridge um, at Carl Ryby Brink um, at toward the end of Meadow Street that will um, connect the new addition there with the Carl Ryby Brink path. So looking forward in the next year, some of our goals are um, we'll have bike to work day um, on Friday, May 20th. So we're planning on being at the corner of 6th and Main. We will cheer you on if you're on your bicycle going to work that morning. Um, but you can also stop by and once again we will have refreshments because we like a good coffee and donut. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, so, and also an opportunity to talk with us about, about pathways and cycling. Um, the next day, we will have a booth at the farmer's market on the 21st and also on the 27th. And we, we really value that opportunity to talk with the public about what you like, what you wish we had, um, and to promote access. Some people don't know about how to get to some of our pathways. Um, and then that same day on the 21st, that afternoon, we will have a, a bike tour. So we'll start at Gormley Park. This is open to the public um, at 1.30, and we will take off toward Washington um, along the path. So we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with our pathways, and uh, it, we'll get to experience a short ride together um, and just get people out and enjoying the space. And then we have planned uh, our first annual pedestrian tour. Um, previously, we had always had uh, an annual bicycle tour, but this will offer perhaps access to more people to get to um, learn about these spaces. Uh, we'll get to spend more time in a shorter section of space. Um, so it will be a kind of different experience for us. Uh, but we're hoping that we'll also um, invite more people who maybe aren't cyclists to get to experience our paths. Uh, we also continue to locate orphan paths and pedestrian rights of way. Um, these are spaces that are um, they're undeveloped, but um, citizens are commonly using them. Um, and so it's through a right of way, so it's okay for them to be <laughs> walking through these spaces, but it's not a developed pathway or sidewalk. Um, the benefit there is that um, they're usually spaces that connect sidewalks and paths. So if people know about them, it might make it easier for you to choose to walk, choose to cycle. So we continue to look out for those spaces and advertise them. Um, and we will continue to pursue and advise on the underpass at US 95. Um, if you're not familiar with this concept, we are looking at another underpass for Paradise Path um, to go under US 95 at about the intersection with, um, the, with Highway 8. Uh, the benefit there is that you will get to um, enjoy a safer crossing of the highway uh, and you'll avoid a couple of exit spots with where the identity apartments are. So it'll make it safer for people to go through that space, um, especially if you have kids, um, and, and just easier for everybody to make a choice to use that. Um, and continue to pursue involvement in discussions where we have new developments, how pathways can fit into their decisions. And uh, a kind of continuous project we've been looking at is um, additional lighting along the pathway from US 95 to Steiner Avenue. It's kind of a darker space. It uh, goes further away from the highway, and so you don't get the benefit of the highway lighting when it starts to get dusk or dark. So that's, that's everything we have planned. Um, are there any questions or comments? Sandra. Gosh, I just wanted to say I had the great pleasure of serving for two times in a row on the pathways as a liaison. And I got to tell you, the first time I got a son, I'm like, cool. What are they going to talk about for an hour? And oh my gosh, you taught me so much. <laughs> I loved, I mean, I know how to get from point A to point B, but man, I know a lot of different ways now to get from A to B, <laughs> which is cool. And I love the idea of orphan pathways that just piqued my interest. I'm always on the lookout now. Um, and I loved working with the maps. And it just really, it was a joy to be on that. Commission, it was really fun to hear from you all and learn from you. And I know that you haven't been the chair very long. No. And um, <laughs> I remember you being really nervous, and it's really fun to see you go into this role, too. So if, if you don't know what the Pathways Commission is about, you should really check it out. Go on the tours. I'm excited about the walk. I remember being a part of those discussions, and I'm really looking forward to it. And I just am so thrilled with the work you all do, because I really didn't think, honestly, what are they going to talk about for an hour? <laughs> Y'all could go on for hours, and it would be interesting. So thank you so much for, for teaching this newbie the ropes on Pathways. Yeah, thanks. thank you, Councillor Kelly. That, we appreciate that. Pathways was the, one of the first <coughs> two that I got assigned when I got reappointed or got appointed to council. And I remember a couple things. You were so friendly. And, <laughs> and the whole group was so excited about Pathways. And I don't even know that you were a commission at that point. You maybe still were a task force, right? And I've never seen anybody like Margaret, 
who can identify an orphan path from <laughs> 80 yards away. And, and I, I will agree with my, my cohort here. You guys had to cut it off at an hour talking and planning. And it's just a really cool, passionate, fun group. And um, it was really nice to cut my teeth on it, for sure. So thank you. And it, it's fun when you guys come in and share the, <laughs> share the fun. Thank you, Councillor Trucio. I have a couple of questions. And one is, is how far is the bike tour? It's, I think, one and a half miles there and back. I, I measured it. Now I can't. It's between one and a half and two miles um, for Sounds the full adorable. round trip. Um, and then the walking path? We have not yet decided on a route for that. It will be in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but I would expect it to be about an hour at a leisurely pace because we want to be inclusive. Okay, great, thanks. I have a question. Um, so I, I've, I see those, uh, the graphics for, um, I think it's called the green, green belt signs and I wasn't sure if that was also under the umbrella of the Pathways Commission or, or if it was a Parks and Rec thing, but. I believe that was actually developed by transportation, is that correct? Public Works, correct. And so that, so, and some of those, right, I, I see them when I'm up in the Fort Russell neighborhood where it's like some, some of our uh, residential streets have the, have the bike logo, the bike lane things painted on the streets, and so I wasn't sure if that was um, in partnership with, with, with what happens with the Pathways group, but. Um, <laughs> Councilor Lewis, uh, great question. The way I kind of frame it in my mind is if it's a bike lane, something that's on the street, yeah. the um, greenway, Public Works, Transportation Commission. If it's more of a pathway, something separated, um, we're uh, Parks and Rec Pathways Commission. That makes sense. Um, we're working on um, coordinating better with the Transportation Commission. It's been one of our goals for the um, last two years, I believe. So Yeah, that's awesome. And I guess that makes sense because if you're, I mean, in some of the green belt stuff, right, it's, it's, when car, it's when the bikes are behaving as cars, right, more, more, the focus is more on them as like the means to the end, whereas Pathways is um, more leisurely and community engagement, which I appreciate. So thank but, you. Appreciate but that it. does speak toward the concept of connectivity. It's mm -hmm. not just connectivity of a single entity like a pathway. Yeah. It means I want to go from my home to my job or to the store or to a friend's house. So that could be anything. And however, you can do that full path safely. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, so I was there way back when on council when we converted the Paradise Path Commission, well, committee into, Pathway. yep, into the Pathways Commission, and it was a good thing. And Margaret out there worked very hard to get that done. And it's it's been great to identify these orphan paths and get more bikeable community going. And I invite everybody to be there on the 21st. I'll be back less than 12 hours from an extremely long airplane flight, and my <laughs> legs will need exercise, so I'm going to be there riding That'll be perfect. on Saturday. So really good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next up is the Downtown Streetscape Professional Services Agreement. Mr. Cody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. It's interesting, I consider myself probably equal parts planning slash cycling nerd, and I hadn't heard the term um, orphan pathway before, and so I have, have some new, new, new uh, lingo, lingo to use. Um, in all seriousness, we're here uh, before you this evening uh, seeking approval to enter into a professional services agreement for design and engineering services uh, related to our downtown uh, streetscape. But before we get into the, the basics of that, that potential contract, I did just want to explain just a little bit about how we got here. Um, in 2015, uh, the city identified uh, the condition of the downtown infrastructure, the streetscape, as a major challenge. Uh, most of the streetscape, as, as you well know, uh, was completed, I believe, in 1981. And with the exception of uh, Friendship Square in 2006, there hasn't been a lot of a lot of change. Um, the desire and recognition uh, for the need to improve some of this infrastructure has been cited a number of times, including a fairly detailed effort that occurred, I believe, in 2002 in conjunction uh, with the University of Idaho. Um, you can see here some of those improvements that occurred to Friendship Square in 2006, and I think it's a certainly a place we all we all treasure. But even some of these improvements are starting to show their show their age a little bit. 
Uh, most recently, in 2018, the Urban Renewal Agency actually had updated their boundary uh, to include the Main Street Corridor. And that's significant in that the Urban Renewal Agency can contribute then in, in funding and assist both with design um, and construction. So with that, um, that basic background, we did issue a, a request for qualifications for design services uh, back in January of this year. Again, we're seeking design and engineering services and also referenced the, the important need for community engagement as part of this process. Uh, we did receive seven, um, seven statements of qualifications, which actually made our selection process quite tough, but was a tremendous benefit because there were, there were a lot of good um, applications. All seven uh, were reviewed by a five-member uh, staff committee that, includes, uh, that included both David and Amanda, who are with us um, this evening. We evaluated all seven proposals and uh, elected to interview two different groups. Uh, those groups uh, provided a brief presentation and then responded to a um, question and ans answer period. Uh, as you can see in your packet, the group ultimately selected a group led by Welch, a team led by Welch Comer of Coeur d'Alene, uh, for, for the design services. Uh, so again, I think it's, it's important um, to discuss just briefly though, you know, we, we are here asking for your support to enter into a, a contract for design services, but we should set expectations a little bit um, and talk about just what the project is and maybe what it, what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't a downtown revitalization. Downtown is, is certainly wonderful. A lot of the bones or the good things you'd read about in modern pla planning uh, literature are in place. Uh, the way the buildings frame the street, a lot of the bulb outs and things, in a lot of ways it's a very safe, comfortable place. So it's not something where we're asking uh, to enter a contract to redo downtown. But certainly the infrastructure, both what you see above ground in terms of the sidewalks and then some of the infrastructure below grade um, is dated. And so we're looking to improve those, um, those facilities. So with that, uh, certainly part of the project is to create a new vision or a vision for an update to the downtown uh, streetscape. And with that, uh, we're seeking uh, the consultant's help in pre preparing a cost estimate. And then with that cost estimate, a detailed phasing plan. All of that will help us develop a funding strategy for the ultimate uh, construction drawings um, and improvements. Certainly all of this couldn't be done at once and phasing will be extremely important. I think it's also important to be clear that this isn't a staff or a council project. Uh, we'll certainly have our parts from a staff perspective and then mayor and council will ultimately need to bless uh, the final design. But this is a community project. It's, it's their downtown or, their, or our living room. Uh, so outreach with this is as much is as much, if not more important, than the design uh, services themselves. And you can see we've, we've already started um, looking at ways we can leverage you know, opportunities we have with, with existing groups, existing staff, and then we've already started working at forming a, a steering committee to help um, advise us along the way. All of this work will ultimately result um, in a 30 to 60% conceptual design package complete with a phasing plan and then cost estimate for each phase. Uh, that final design, and there's a lot that will lead up to this, will come back to council ultimately for, uh, for approval. And so in terms of what's, what's next, in, in terms of timing, this will take uh, certainly well into the end of 2022, perhaps into early uh, 23 to wrap things up. Uh, I'd love to say we start construction in 23 and if, if uh, Bill were here, he'd probably cringe a little bit, and that is, <laughs> that is probably overly ambitious. But ultimately, the design, the design and the phasing will inform future construction drawing packages and then a phased approach uh, to this project. So that all of that's a lot of words to say that we are asking for your approval this evening to enter into a design uh, contract for this exciting project for Moscow. Uh, the number included in your packet, the $161,000, would be split equally with the Urban Renewal Agency, uh, the majority of that funding would occur uh, in fiscal year 2022, but given the schedule, it's likely that some will bridge that, bridge that gap or cross over into fiscal uh, year 2023. We both, both, agent, both groups have budgeted for that in fiscal year 22, and we'll need to make slight adjustments for that remainder in 23. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have a question, if that's okay. Yes, it is. Um, so I don't, I don't understand what the meaning of the 30 to 60% of conceptual design is, and so can you help me understand 
Also, like, why throw a percentage on it, right? I just don't get, I don't know what that means versus 100% conceptual design. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lewis, uh, it's, it's 30 to 60% is effectively the, it's not final construction drawings, but it's concepts that are refined enough to give us a good informed uh, cost estimate. So we're not asking them to like be able to tell us where like the water pipes, if we're talking about like, it, it's meant to make it an easier criteria for them to, to I guess, hit, hit what we're going for. Is that fair? Uh, certainly, it, it informs the, the public and okay. council kind of, of, of just from a design feel what it will look like okay. and that they've gone to enough detail and survey work that it's a realistic estimate in terms of in terms of cost and phasing. Gotcha. Thank you. Does that mean we go back to them and then say we've approved the conceptual idea and they will then create a another more final project? Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Laughlin, that, Laughlin, that's correct. We would have to go back in a subsequent um, under a subsequent contract to create final construction drawings and phased plans. Sandra. So when looking at this, um, I'm probably not alone in saying that, yes, I think this probably needs to be done. But on the other hand, we seem to be hitting a really interesting time in our country right now in terms of inflation, in terms of possible recession, and in terms of another possible housing issue. And so if we spend this money to get a conceptual design, and it's nice, but all of a sudden steel prices and everything are outrageous, I know you don't have a crystal ball. Gosh, we'd all be really rich if you did. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, looking at, at trying to look ahead as much as we can, while I'm not against this at all, I do have concerns about spending this much money right now on something when it looks like everything's getting really out of control price-wise. Does that make sense? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Kelly, ab absolutely. It, it scares us as well. <laughs> I think a number of these improvements at some point will become necessity. Um, and sure. so, you know, even, even from a maintenance standpoint, ADA accessibility some of this will simply just have to be done. At least it'll, it'll give us a framework and an, an understanding of where we're at cost-wise and, and help inform some of those decisions long-term. Certainly this would be a phase, all of the construction would be a phased approach. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Tina. I have a comment first and then I'll, I'll make a motion. Um, I, I agree completely with um, Sandra in that this is a, an important project and you're right. Um, a little scary right now with how things are costed and everything, but having been one of those normally abled individuals, almost taken a header in front of the storm cellar on that weird <laughs> pavement there, um, I do agree that we're going to have some necessity items very soon, and, and it'll be interesting to see the phasing as it goes forward. I think it is another example, and every time we have this opportunity, I say it, this is an example of how an urban renewal agency cooperates with the city in which it resides and shines as the example of how it should be done. Okay, off my soapbox. Uh, Your Honor, I move approval of the professional services agreement with Welch Comer. A second. I have one more thing I would add. Okay, that's okay. further discussion, go. Um, <laughs> I'm with you, Sandra, and that's, and I was, uh, this is really helpful for me understanding how we got here, and so I was glad to have this on the full agenda after we heard it first at Public Works. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of going back to is these seems these seem like plans, and I would imagine that the community vision that we get feedback on for this concept, if we end up needing to put it on the shelf, I imagine it's not going to get too dusty or too irrelevant. And so my hope is, if we need to be, um, if we need to pinch some pennies, that that we'll be able to dust it off and and be okay after the fact. Um, and it's fun to see that it's someone kind of close to home who, who staff is recommending, so. Yep. Also, is the URA well positioned to assist in this endeavor? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mayor, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but they have in their, in their CIP been, been planning to contribute to the construction as well as design. That's music to my ears as well. <laughs> as a follow-up on that, as, yep. as a member of the URA, the answer is, it's already been discussed, it already went through URA, just at their most recent meeting, and so they're all very familiar with that and know that they have the money ready cool. to do that. Good. Julia. I have a question about public input for this process. Do you have, a, I know that people in Moscow are very um, dedicated to having a voice in their downtown, and <laughs> I just want to know if you have an idea of when public input might start um, and what kind of forms that might take. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Parker, 
Parker, I don't have the kind of the specific check-in points, but certainly multiple times along the way, we'd, we'd have a steering committee that includes, you know, representatives of the business community, various industries that we would engage regularly. Um, two or three public meetings to where actual design material can be presented and receive feedback. And then we also see an opportunity to leverage some of the social media channels, um, public events, um, if, we can, if we can perhaps attend uh, the market and things like that. So uh, <laughs> seeking public impact input both on um, design alternatives and the final design concept before we brought anything back to council for, cool. for approval. And it does have built into the contract, I think it was two or three uh, exchanges or presentations to council. One of those would be that final design. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, Maureen. Aye. Julia. Aye. Gina. Aye. Sandra. Aye. Haley. Aye. There you go. Thank you. Off to work. Okay, that takes us to the end of the agenda. Uh, reports. Um, Sandra, you're up. Um, yeah, so I went to the part of the Human Rights Commission. We had an, another meeting that same night, so I had to jump out early. But things are progressing well for their um, uh, month of diversity and inclusivity, which is usually in September. So please keep watching as time grows more, and I'll have, hopefully have more updates on what's going on. But they really do try to make that a big event for Moscow throughout the month. So looking forward to that. Um, and then they're continuing with, with all the really strong, good things that they do. So I'm, I'm impressed with what, what's going on there. Um, I went to a reception at MZ where they introduced a new CEO, but because of that, I wasn't able to get historic preservation, and I didn't feel like asking any council members <laughs> to cover because then they would have been skipping that, and so um, it just didn't happen this month, but I do know that they're working on their ORCID awards. If you have any ideas on what you might want to submit for the ORCIDs, please do get uh, reach out. I see lots of nods here because some of my friends from the uh, commissioner there reach out to uh, anyone on that commission. And if you don't know how to do that, find, look on the city page. You can find a way to reach out. Um, orchids are a pretty cool thing. If you see some nice stuff happening out and about Moscow, new buildings that look like might need some attention, then let, it, let them know because they're uh, very excited to uh, highlight the great things in our city. And then uh, in terms of development committee at the 1912 Center, we keep having to put that off, but I keep having run-ins with everyone on the <laughs> development committee. So I have non-official <laughs> development committee news, and things are also progressing, progressing there really well. Um, they're already doing construction up on the third floor, which is great. They're trying to continue to get all of the things that they need for the historic classroom. I believe that they are transitioning back to the book portion of their extra room, which was like the extension of the library book sale, and then they closed it off at Christmas because they were doing Christmas for kids, and now uh, that's emptied again, and I do believe they want to get back to having uh, books from the library overflow, uh, hopefully by donation again. So that's exciting there. And then I can't help but give a plug for Renfair. Saw lots of people there. I had the chance to uh, work with Renfair a lot, not as a council person, just as a community member, but it's a really fun Moscow thing, and I just wanted to Thank everyone for coming out and participating in the weirdness that is Renfair. And mud. I don't know. There's it always, it's spring. Bad. It's Moscow. I don't even. Yeah. yeah. Worse, but it was really fun to have a live event. And, you know, you're always worried about one of the first big live events. And so it was good to see folks out there being careful and celebratory, which I think I can't help but look at Amanda. That's going to really bode well for farmer's market season, too. So um, a, a fun couple weeks in Moscow. Thank you. Maureen. So I attended some of those. I was impressed at how many people on a Friday, when it's on a Saturday when it's wet and cold, that showed up at the one fair. It was unbelievable to me. I just sat there and thought, um, one booth told me they were out of tortilla soup by two o'clock or something. It was like, oh my gosh, um, people were really ready to be there. I also attended the um, the MC Burning Glass reception and. It was very nice to see and meet the new CEO and some of the additional uh, management people there, and I really appreciated the idea of really trying to include um, elected officials. So we had, I mean, a handful of elected officials from like all over the place, um, and so that was really nice. Um, I also appreciated the connection that they wanted to make both with the city and with the university. Um, so I, I, the, both were great events for me. Gina. Uh, last week, let's see, um, I attended the Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee meeting, 
And the biggies from that, there was the coolest. And I am a science nerd and a geology science nerd on top of that. So it was really exciting. Uh, uh, one of the graduate students talked about his monitoring of some um, alluvial uh, wells to talk about the boundaries and how the lower aquifer and the upper aquifer recharge in relation to each other. It was so cool. And we will have more discussion of that, and I, I will try to write down. <laughs> But I'm telling you, you need to come to these meetings. They're awesome. Um, the, the good part is they are also, they had a very good pool of applicants for the executive manager position or executive director now. Um, they had the first round and I believe kind of that first cut uh, interviews on the 22nd. And then tomorrow, four to six out at the Best Western is actually the social with the top three candidates. So you really need to to go. Four to six, hors d'oeuvres, you know, that kind of thing, social, <laughs> that moment. Um, tomorrow is my favorite day of the month because I get to go to the tree commission meeting. <laughs> and I, I had, we had to miss it last month because of like a last minute cancellation. I'm looking at David because I was so excited. And tomorrow we get to live through it finally. So we'll have that. Um, I, due to a, a COVID scare last week, I did not get to go to the MZ Burning Glass, but instead, last minute, got to go to the UI Pitch Contest, which is where the students that are in these upper level um, business classes come to you with their business ideas. And you wear this lanyard that says, I'm the, I'm the decider of your fate, and you give them business cards and everything if they do a good job. And I handed out more business cards this year than ever. It was awesome. And it's really, to me, one of those moments where you go, all right, it's going to be OK. The next generation's got it. And, and it was just really good. Good. Okay, that's Julia. all. Julia. I have no commission meetings to report on. And fair and affordable housing got canceled this week. I did go to Ren Fair like everybody else. Yep. And it was great. And I would encourage younger people to get involved in helping <laughs> plan and execute Ren Fair. Bailey. Uh, my planning and zoning meeting was canceled, um, so it was a quiet week last week. We did have a smart transit meeting. Um, they are still hiring for some workers. It's, uh, I'm sorry, for drivers. It's it's $20 an hour starting wage. It's a really good, really good gig. Um, I'm too scared to drive a car that big, so, which I don't know how many of other people my age feel that way too. Um, but the goal, they plan on adding Saturday service back in time for the farmer's market, which is great to hear. Um, uh, second, everyone's, the, the Ren Fair was great. Um, next year's their 50th, and so they're going to be looking for some extra hands. And so, granted, it's not a city city uh, city organization. It's still a really great chance to get involved. Um, I was going to also plug the Friends of the Library uh, twice annual book sale is on Saturday and is the best, the best... The best, um, I want to say it runs from 9 to 12, it, uh, the proceeds of which go to funding their summer reading program that I grew up participating in, and it's fantastic, so cannot recommend enough. Um, and then... Where's that book sale? Um, oh, I think, it's at the, I think it's back at the fairgrounds. I should have double fact-checked. Um, <laughs> and from 12.30 to 1.30, they do a buck-a-bag book sale, and it's like, it's prime. It's fantastic. Um, and I think that's what I've... God, first farmer's market is on Saturday. I would be a really poor farmer's market liaison if I didn't plug that. So <laughs> plan on going to the market on Saturday and then going over to the book sale. Um, and thanks to this cold, I didn't make it to the burn, burning glass reception. So I'm excited to hear more about it. And yeah, it's been great. Happy May. Yep. Uh, as for me, um, on the 19th, there was the Association of Idaho Cities District 2 oh, meeting yeah, out at the <laughs> Best Western at which... Gina Truscio was elected as a District 2 board member for the AIC, which means that she'll be uh, assisting in uh, sit, talking to the legislature about uh, bills and legislation put forward, support, oppose, or neutral from the point of view of the city. So uh, another city lobbyist, and actually the other District 2 representative, which is the five north central counties in Idaho, the other rep is would be me. So I'm joined by Gina on the board of the AIC. Uh, the uh, 20th and 21st, I lectured, orated, talked, 
with uh, six Moscow High School government classes here in this room, and that was uh, entertaining and interesting. After I got done with my spiel, the questions that came up always, well, you're never sure where the question is coming from, but they sure are interesting. Um, had a police pinning ceremony. We're up one more officer now. Uh, we got this one from Bellingham, I believe. Came back over to his old stomping grounds over here. So yeah, the police come and go. There's always seems to be two perpetual vacancies on the police department is people move out and other people come in, but there always seems to be two vacancies. So for those of you with a uh, public service and law enforcement bent, Think about it, they're always looking for people. Uh, on the 25th, we had the climate change workshop where we reviewed the climate action plan here, got feedback from the public, uh, and that's all going to be incorporated into the next draft of that document that'll help guide Moscow forward uh, in its city operations relative to mitigating climate change. At the airport board meeting, uh, two different days, uh, the terminal design is just about complete now. The structural steel for the roof has been ordered to the tune of something like $2.1 million worth of steel, which is order it now in order to get it in time to be used next year because the supply chain backlog is fierce. Um, let's see. Also, uh, bids go out in mid-May for the terminal itself, and uh, the airport board is applying for... Twelve more million dollars in uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Legislation Act to try to get some more money to fund any deficiencies brought on by construction costs. And last and certainly not least, last Friday was Arbor Day and out at the Milton Arthur Park with Dave Schott and the Tree Commission people, we went out and planted two catalpa trees and uh, had a very nice ceremony with some of the Moscow High School Environmental Club folks who uh, brought along some pollinator boxes for wild bees to be put up. So very nice series of events these past couple of weeks. Seems to have to do with weather warming and getting more decent and all of a sudden more things are happening. Staff, what you got over there? Um, nothing from staff, Mr. Mayor. Well, whatever have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> Getting downtown, okay. taking care it's of Good stuff. It's a joke. It's, a it's, joke. A joke. it's nope. funny. It's a Why hear a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so moved. Okay. Second, third. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're done.